warmly welcome Bishop Thomas Raprocki from And I said, well, what do they want? 
She said that they want you to come out and skate with them. I thought, boy, they're really getting hard up for the goalie if they're calling me to come and be their goalie. But it, it was more of a public relations thing, and uh, they did a nice piece that actually on the WGN News about my visit with the Blackhawks. I skated with them in practice, uh, and I gave them a blessing. Uh, it didn't work right away. Sometimes blessings take a little while, but by 2010, they won uh, their first Stanley Cup in 49 years, and then they repeated with just winning the Cup again uh, last year. So it was really a wonderful experience. I had uh, dressed in the locker room with the players and got to chat with them and I got on the ice with them and they took some shots at me. Well, that led to another invitation. Uh, a couple of years later, I was giving a talk in Columbus, Ohio. And the organizers of the talk asked me, they knew that I had practiced with the Blackhawks. They said, would you like to, to practice with the Columbus Blue Jackets of the National Hockey League? And I said, well, sure, but how are you going to do that? And she said, well, don't worry, I have some connections. So uh, sure enough, I get an email that I should, uh, when I come to Columbus, I should uh, bring my, um, my Colby equipment. And so I did. Now, what was different this time uh, in Columbus, um, I went to the Nationwide Arena, and uh, they had me changing, not in the locker room with the players, as I did in, uh, with the Blackhawks, but they put me in the referee's locker room by myself. And they didn't tell the players who I was. So the coaches knew. Who I was, and they knew why, why I was going to be there. Uh, and this was in October, so it was during training camp. So I go out uh, on the ice, and if you know Nationwide Arena in Columbus, there's two sheets of ice. There's the main rink, and there's also a smaller sheet of ice, uh, a smaller rink uh, next to that. And so I go out there, and the head coach at that time was Ken Hitchcock, who is now the head coach of uh, the St. Louis Blues. And he welcomed me. He said, nice to have you out there to stay. I thank him for the opportunity to stay with them with the Blue Jackets. And he said, uh, we're on the main ice, and he said, uh, I've got a lot of players out here, it's training camp, I've got two goalies on this ice. He said, if you go to the other sheet of ice, there's only, there's more players there, there's only one goalie, so you get a chance for some more shots. So I went over there, and uh, sure enough, I, I, I step on the ice, I've got all my goalie equipment on, including my mask, so covering my face so they can't see my gray and thinning hair, or they didn't see how old I was. So I just step on the ice, and I hear one of the players say, oh good, we have another goalie. And they put me in the nets and they proceeded to do their practice. So it really got my adrenaline going because they were just doing a full NHL practice. I didn't do that with Blackhawks, they just kind of put me in at the end to take some shots at me. I did a full practice with the Columbus Blue Jackets. At the end of the practice, there was a reporter there who apparently didn't know who I was, and so she was interviewing one of the players and said, Well, how do you like shooting at the bishop? And he said, Well, what bishop? And she said, Well, the other goalie down there was a Catholic bishop. And he said, well, I didn't know that. I thought we were just just another goalie. <laughs> so then I thanked Coach Hitchcock for the invitation and the opportunity to escape with them. He said, Bishop, how about a blessing for the team? So I said, okay, that'd be fine. I said, I'll give you a blessing. It's good against everyone except the Blackhawks. <laughs> he said, what kind of blessing is that? I said, well, look at it this way. If you beat everybody except the Blackhawks, at least you'll make a playoffs. Now, those of you who know hockey know, hockey know that it is the only year that the Columbus Blue Jackets have ever qualified for the Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe my blessings help a little bit. With that. So, uh, we got them to the playoffs with that blessing. So, uh, well, let's get into our topic here. So, um, there are eight steps, basically, uh, that I'm going to talk about. Three of them are challenges. And uh, five of them, I think, are responses to those challenges. The three challenges are fear, failure, and frustration. And I'll be talking about those challenges in the context of sports, but also in everyday life. And then the, and five responses that I identify to those. Uh, and then those responses are faith, fortitude, family, friendship, and fun. By the way, it's been pointed out to me that all eight of those steps start with the letter F. Now, I tell people I've been in a lot of locker rooms and I hear the F word a lot. My book has a lot of F words in it. Hopefully to teach people good F words that you could use and not the bad one. So uh, let's just start with uh, one of those good ones. Let's just go here. There we go. Fear. St. Francis de Sales says that fear is greater evil than evil itself. Um, all up here so we can kind of see. Um, our 
Are you sure? Now, I started out with that telling this because my, my book starts out with a story about how I was supposed to play hockey um, one night and I was really looking forward to playing as an outdoor skate, uh, which is a little bit different. I went back. Oh. Okay. Um, it's a lot of fun skating outdoors. If you, if you don't do that very often, most of the rinks are indoors now. So I was looking forward to it, but I had a terrible cold. And I was out for lunch with a priest friend of mine telling him I'm supposed to play hockey that night. He said, are you sure? Are you sure you want to play? I said, yes, I, I'm dying to play. I love to play this game, even if I'm not feeling well. So I went out and I played the game. And uh, you know, for a goalie, I'll talk a little bit about the fears of a goalie. Uh, goalies have a lot of fear. Uh, I can describe some of them. Um, those of you who are a little bit older might remember uh, a great goalie that played with Chicago Blackhawks by the name of Tony Esposito. He's a, he's a uh, Hall of Fame goalie. Uh, Tony's wife uh, told me once that Tony on game days, Tony wouldn't talk to her. Not that he was mad, he wasn't giving her the silent treatment, he just clammed up on game days. He didn't talk to anyone because he was so nervous. And his predecessor, another great goalie with the Chicago Blackhawks, Glenn Hall, uh, he used to get sick to his stomach before games and in between periods. And he used to say that if he didn't get sick to his stomach, he would be worried that he was not going to be on his game because he wasn't. He, he needed that adrenaline, he needed that anxiety in order to be at the peak of his game. And I could identify with that. Goalies, there's a lot of fear in being a goalie. Now, most people who are not goalies might think that what are goalies afraid of? They might think what goalies are afraid of when you stop to think about it, even though you're wearing equipment, you're, you're standing in front of a net with people shooting a hard uh, rubber vulcanized puck at you at up to 100 miles an hour. That's got to be pretty frightening. Those of you who are goalies, is that what scares you? A little bit, maybe, but not really. Especially not in the NHL. I'm sure you have any goalies that say they're afraid of getting in the net because they might get hit by the puck. I've got stitches from the puck hitting my mask and, and the mask cutting my forehead and I've got broken my finger, I've had knee surgery, I've had all kinds of bruises, black and blue. It doesn't stop me. I get, you know, you recover, you get back out of the, in the nets. That's just part of the game. So, if we're not afraid of getting hurt, what is the goalie's big fear? Giving up goals. Giving up bad goals, easy goals, any goals. You stop to think about it. Being a goalie is the only position in any sport, it's the only job in the world where if you make a mistake, they put on a red light. <laughs> think about that. Think about your job. You're sitting at your desk and you make a mistake. Red light goes off, everybody starts, you know, booing or cheering depending which side you're on, and, and you know, you're the focus of attention. The uh, if you ever go to a hockey game at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, the, uh, the students there have a great tradition. Uh, when the Notre Dame Irish score a goal, they razz the opposing goalie. And what do they say? They call out his name. They'll repeat his name over and over again. So like if his, his name is uh, Wilson, they might say, Wilson, Wilson, Wilson. You let the whole team down. And they just keep chanting this at them. So I mean, imagine that's what you have to face when you're a goalie and you give up a goal. A red light goes off, people start jeering at you. And so you have to be able to deal with that fear. So that brings up the question, well, how do we face our fears and how do we deal with them? Now, there are a lot of different fears that we have in life. So this is why I'm going to be talking now about how we apply some of the fears that we have in sports we apply to everyday life. And we have lots of fears in our work, in our families, in our jobs. They say, you know, the, the surveys or polls that they take, the number one fear that most people have, it's not dying, that's, that's actually number two. You know what the number one fear is that most people have? It's what I'm doing right now, public speaking. That's what really frightens people more than anything, the idea of getting up and talking in front of a crowd. And believe it or not, when I was in the seminary, that was one of my biggest fears. I wanted to be a priest from as long as I can remember. My mother tells me I was about four years old when I started talking about wanting to be a priest. 
And so I went to a high school seminary and a college seminary in, the, in Chicago, where I grew up. And it was in high school and even in college where I kind of felt like I maybe want to be a priest, but this business about getting up in the pulpit and, and giving homilies, I don't know if I can do that. And that was probably one of my biggest fears, so much so that the director uh, in college had, had talked with me about that. You know, I was pretty quiet. And I still considered myself to be basically a kind of a quiet person. And so what was I going to do? Well, that raises the question that when you have a fear about something, there are different ways to face it. And one way that you can face your fear is to run from it. And so that's what a lot of people do. Public speaking, no way, I don't want anything to do with that. Or you face your fear and you overcome it. Obviously, I've learned how to do public speaking. I do it all the time. It doesn't face me anymore. I still consider myself to be basically a quiet person, but I have no trouble getting up in front of a congregation and giving a homily or in front of a group like this. How did I do that? Well, when I was in college, I just took some speech courses. And in the seminary, I took some courses in homiletics where they teach you how to do public speaking. You look at videotapes of yourself speaking and learn what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And so for me, I overcame that fear through the skills that I acquired. And so basically, that's what I'm saying in everyday life. We can run from our fears, or we can learn how to overcome our fears. You know, one of the phrases, as you read the Bible, one of the phrases that we see uh, repeatedly in the Bible is, be not afraid. That was the message uh, that was given to Mary when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and announced that she was going to be the mother of God. It was the message that the angels gave to the shepherds uh, when we read the story about the nativity of Christ, when they heard that the Savior was going to be born, the angels said, be not afraid. It was the message given to Joseph in a dream when the angel told Joseph to take Mary and Jesus to Egypt to flee from the threat and persecution of King Herod. It's a message repeated by Jesus repeatedly. It's a message we see often frequently in the Old Testament. Be not afraid. In fact, very soon, in April, the church is going to do a canonization of Blessed John Paul II and John XXIII as saints. And when John Paul II was elected Pope and appeared to the people for the first time from the balcony of St. Peter's in Rome, what was his message? Quoting Jesus, he said, be not afraid. Now, I, I thought a lot about that, about his saying that. Because I was, I read, like many significant things, you remember exactly where you were when you heard these things. Now, remember, I'm from, I grew up in Chicago, which is the largest Polish community outside of Warsaw. I'm Polish American. My great grandparents came from Poland. And prior to the election of John Paul II, it was not, un, not uncommon for people to tell Polish jokes in a very disparaging way. So I remember in October of 1978, I was at uh, DePaul at the law school waiting for the elevator when someone came up to me and said, have you heard the news? I said, what's that? There's a new pope. They've elected a new pope and he's Polish. I said, okay, what's the punchline? <laughs> and I serious, seriously thought it was a joke. But he said, no, for real, we have a Polish pope. Well, so when the pope got up in the balcony and said, be not afraid, I thought, well, who's he talking to? He's not talking to me. I'm not afraid of a Polish pope. I think this is wonderful that we have a Polish pope. And it, as, I, as I thought about that over the years, I realized he probably was talking to himself more than anyone else. I mean, the idea of being the shepherd of over a billion Catholics throughout the world has got to be pretty daunting. And so that message of Jesus, I'm sure, was very reassuring to him, uh, more so than to us. As I said, I don't think we needed it as much as he did. Be not afraid. And so that message of our Lord is what helps us to overcome our fears, including the fear of death, even though, in a sense, it's not our, our worst fear, as I said, public speaking. But in a sense, it's our ultimate fear, because it, 
is something we all have to face. It's death. And that's what Jesus says, be not afraid. Be not afraid of that eventuality that will come for all of us. That when we die, there's a great promise. There's a great reward that he's held out for us. And, and through our baptism, through our faith, and through the grace that God gives, he gives us the possibility and the promise of sharing in that reward. Let's go on to frustration. St. Bernard said, if Christ is with us, who is against us? So, let's start out with Chicago sports. All right, so I grew up in Chicago. And for a Chicago fan, there's a lot of frustration being a Chicago fan. Now, I mentioned that so the Blackhawks have won the Stanley Cup in, the two, in 2010 and 2013. Well, the last cup prior to that was 1961. You know, so I just barely remember that when I was a little boy. Uh, so for most of my life, including my adult life, my favorite team wasn't winning anything. Uh, the Chicago Bears, they won a championship back in 1963, but didn't win a Super Bowl again until 1985. And that was the last one that they had they won. Uh, we did do pretty well with the Chicago Bulls in the 1990s, as much as Jackson, much as Jordan, rather. <laughs> much as Jordan. Uh, but I'm not a big basketball fan. Uh, and then there's baseball. I'm a White Sox fan. Now, you know in Chicago there's this big rivalry between the White Cubs and the White Sox. Uh, Cubs fans are traditionally from the north side, White Sox fans from the south side. I grew up on the south side. That's one of the reasons why I'm a Sox fan, but not the only reason. I mean, there's Cubs fans on the south side and White Sox fans on the north side. I kind of like the White Sox uh, because I like to follow a team that's won something in my lifetime. You know, so, you know, the Cubs, they haven't won a World Series since 1908. So everybody's entitled to a bad century. That's kind of what they say about the Cubs. I don't hate the Cubs. I just feel sorry for Cub fans, you know. And I, I tell Cub fans, I pray for you, you know. I hope that God will have mercy on you someday. And maybe they'll win something in your lifetime. But my point is, you know, for whether you're a Chicago fan, almost any, any team, we deal with a lot of frustration because our teams are are not winning so much, as much as we want them to, and so there's always, always next year. Frustrations are always are also a part of sports uh, and of life. So frustrations in learning how to play a sport well. I started out playing floor hockey. There weren't any rinks near my home when I was growing up, and so and we actually played floor hockey uh, in the basement uh, of our apartment building. My father was a pharmacist, and we owned a drugstore. We had a long, narrow basement uh, under the pharmacy. And I have six brothers, so we kind of had our own hockey team. Uh, we would go down to the basement and do a sticks and, and a plastic puck and make nets out of boxes and get a few kids over from the neighborhood, and, and we had our own hockey league down there. And then when I was in eighth grade, uh, I joined the boys' club, and they had floor hockey in the gym at the boys' club, and I played there, and uh, they, they wanted somebody to play goalie, and I volunteered this time when I started out playing goalie. And played it pretty much ever since. I played some roller hockey. Eventually, I did learn how to ice skate. Uh, but I remember was learning how to ice skate as an older person. It's a little tougher. You know, I think they're very smart in Canada because like, they teach their kids how to ice skate before they learn how to walk. You know, you see these little two-year-olds and they've got ice skates on. And so, little, you get a little kid on the ice, and they just they fall like a kid walking. You just fall, and they pick themselves up because it's not that far, that hard to fall. But for an adult, if you're an adult and you're learning how to skate like, like I was, uh, then it's, you know, falling is a little bit more of an issue and you don't like to fall. And, and so it's very frustrating when you're trying to learn how to do something and you're falling and, and you're not getting it quite right. Um, you heard it in, in my introduction. I studied a lot of languages. I love, I love languages. I kind of have a knack for languages. Languages are fun to learn, but they're also very frustrating. When you're learning a language and you try to talk to, to someone or you're, you're listening to someone and they're saying words you don't know what they're saying and you don't know how to express yourself, you get very frustrated. So there's a lot of things in life that we, we would like to do better and we're not doing them quite the way we want to do them. And so those are some of our, our frustrations. I'd say that uh, this applies to Christianity as well. Christianity is, um, is also counterintuitive. What I mean by that is you know, to learn how to ice skate, you have to, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you're always wanting, 
kind of prevent yourself from falling and to really learn how to skate well, you kind of get yourself into the skate uh, and again you get get into the, the flow and the mo movement that is a little bit counterintuitive. It's, it's very similar for us, I think, learning how to be a good Christian. It's counterintuitive. Jesus and his teaching tells us to do things that our culture doesn't, doesn't relate to. And I think that's becoming more and more the case. Uh, that it used to be that our culture, and our American culture at least, and our Christian cultures were kind of insane. If you consider this like a river that we were going with the current, we were going in the, in the same direction down, uh, down the stream. I think what's happened today is that we are, uh, to be a Christian is much more countercultural. Uh, what we mean by marriage and what our secular society means by marriage today are really two different things. Uh, and so it, those used to be the same. You're going down the same path. But when we talk about marriage and when, when the media or government officials talk about marriage these days, they're talking about something entirely different. So in that sense, we're going against the tide. We're going in different directions. And so to be a Christian, and Jesus you know, talks about uh, this, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the blessed are you when you are persecuted. And Jesus himself was often ridiculed in his teaching. People walked away from him because they didn't want to accept what he was saying. And so to be a good Christian requires us to be somewhat uh, counter uh, culture, counterintuitive and countercultural. We learn skills to, to ward off these frustrations, and we learn virtues. The virtues like persistence, determination, perseverance, and in the end, the virtual hope is what helps us to look forward to overcoming our frustrations. Here's our the last of the three challenges that I want to talk about. Um, this is failure. And uh, here we have uh, a quote from uh, now St. Jose Maria Striva, who have not failed, you have gained experience forward. The question there, did you win? This uh, was a question that was asked to me uh, shortly after I became Bishop of Springfield in Illinois uh, in uh, 2010. I was attending a, a priest convocation. And so as a new bishop, uh, I didn't know a lot of the priests very well yet. And so one of the older priests, one of the senior priests came up to me and he knew, he knew that I was a marathon runner. In fact, I had just run a marathon that month. And uh, so we're in line waiting for lunch at the buffet. And he looks at me and he says, well, Bishop, did you win? And, uh, you know, he kind of took me by surprise. But I had to think, well, what are you referring to? And he said, well, the marathon, you just ran, ran a marathon, did you win? And that's when I realized I've never gone into a marathon expecting to be the first one to cross the finish line. <laughs> so that's what he was thinking. Did you win? And that's says, well, no, I, I, didn't win, I didn't win that marathon, but I wasn't the first one to cross the finish line. But did I win? Well, yes, because what was my goal? My goal was to finish the marathon. So I finished 20 marathons. And in that sense, I consider that to be a winner. I finished 20 marathons, and, and one of my goals was to qualify for Boston. I've done that. So in, in that sense, I've won. And also, as mentioned in the introduction, I raised money uh, as part of my marathon running effort. And uh, people have been very generous in response. So for me, every marathon that, I work, that I've run is a winner. But what that says to me is it's all a matter of perspective in terms of you know, how we look at life and winning and losing. And where some people might find failure, uh, other people are seeing uh, victory. So it's a matter of perspective. I also think that we can, we can learn from our failures. I have on that we can learn from our failures, but you know, we also learn from our successes. Uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. So learning from our, our failures, you know, failure actually is, I think, essential in order to learn. You have to fail, because if you're not failing, that means you're not testing your limits. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. I, I also do some weightlifting. I'm not a you know, power lifter or anything like that, but I do. I go to the health club and I do some weightlifting from time to time just to kind of keep in shape. So one of the things I do is I do some bench pressing. And you get on the bench press, and I do kind of a, a typical pyramid. I'll, I'll add increasing weights up to a peak weight, and then I'll decrease it back down. And then at the very end, 
I'll get to a very light weight, and I'll do as many repetitions as I can until failure. That's kind of how it's designed. Your, your, your coaches will tell you this, your training coach will say, do as many reps as you can until failure. Well, yeah, because you're going to see how many can you do until you cannot do any more. You better have a spotter when you're doing that. But, uh, but when you do that, you're kind of testing your limits. And I think you can appreciate it. And what I'm saying then is like, all right, if I say I'm going to take the lightest, I take a very light weight, the lightest weight that I started with, and I'm going to go back and I'm, I'm going to do five reps. I do my five reps, that was easy, and I'm done. Well, what, what did I accomplish with that? But if I'm doing as many reps as I can until I just can't do any more, and the spotter has to set the bar for me, well, then I, I push my limits. So that's what I mean in the sense of, we have, to, we have to push our limits to, to learn from our failures, but we also have to learn from our successes. That was, you know, we, we looked at what we did wrong and we tried to correct it, but we also learned from what we're doing right. And I know this as, as a goalie, that when I, and to be a good goalie, you have to be able to let go of your mistakes very quickly. So you give up a goal, you quickly analyze what did you do wrong, and you move on, and you let it go. But you can also learn from that what to what to do better next time. And the next time when you, you make that correction and you make it save, you've learned from your success more than your failure. You've learned, I need to do this a different way. Very simple example, you know, as a goal, you have to be square to the puck. Are you square to the puck or are you square to the shooter? If I'm square to the shooter, then I'm not square to where I need to be. It's a very simple correction. I gotta remember to be square to the puck. Another very simple thing. I, I served as the goalie coach at our Catholic high school in Springfield. Uh, there's only one goalie, so it's, uh, it's very easy to work with him. Uh, in fact, since there is only one goalie, they ask me to suit up. I suit up, and I'm the other goalie that they shoot at in practice. So I work with the, with the goalie. And uh, the goalie that I started working with uh, when I came to Springfield in 2010, he graduated last year, and we have a freshman goalie this year. We still, need, we still only have one goalie. But at the start of the season, uh, you know, we, I was just giving him some pointers, and I, I asked him, I said, uh, when, when somebody takes a shot at you, do you sometimes blame for your flinch? And he said, yeah. I said, well, first of all, good. I'm glad you told the truth because it's not nice to lie to the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, that's good to know because that's a natural reaction. And I would be a little suspect if you told me you didn't blink. When they shoot at you, uh, because when somebody's shooting that puck at you, that's a natural reaction. You're going to blink. And in that blink, you lose sight of the puck for just a split second. But sometimes it's enough of you to lose your focus and lose your attention that a puck, uh, the shot will get by you. So I said, part of what you have to do to be a good goalie is to train yourself to keep your eyes open. It sounds simple, but I'll do this. The other goalie, the goalie just graduated, I asked him a question once. Uh, I said, when, you, uh, when you're in a game, you ever talk to yourself? And again, kind of sheepishly, he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> I said, good. You should talk to yourself. Because I, what I want you to do is when you're out there, I want you to be coaching yourself. I want you to say things to yourself about your confidence. You can stop the shot. When they're coming at you, you can make this safe. And then a little reminder, stay square to the puck. Your belly is your bullseye. And keep your eyes open. Eyes wide open. And again, it's a little thing, but if, you're, if I'm saying that to myself, they're coming to shake, take a shot at me, eyes wide open, and then you remember, and you see the shot, you don't blink. I said my goalie last night, playing one we won our game last night, I said, just keep saying that to yourself, because I believe if you can see the shot, you can stop it. Do you believe that? He said, yes. And he played a great game with 162 last night. So uh, those are just some examples of uh, how we can learn from our failures and our successes. And in terms of even the best can fail, we think about this perspective in terms of failure. The very best hitter of all time, the best batter in Major League Baseball, Ted Williams, 401 average. What does that mean? Translate that. That means he's, he failed six times out of 10. A good Major League hitter, if you're batting 300, that's pretty good in the Major Leagues. What does that translate to? Failing seven times out of 10. So you better get used to failure 
that you want to see. Because if you're the kind of person that the first time you go up and you swing a bat and strike off, say, I failed, I'm not going to ever try that again. Well, there's no way you'll ever succeed because you haven't even tried. All right, let me, uh, one more uh, thing here on failure. So, all right. So when we overcome our failures and we succeed, we get sports, we get trophies, right? Greatest trophy of all, I think, is the Stanley Cup in hockey, but most other sports have trophies too. What's the trophy that we have in the church? Our trophy is the cross. That's, again, countercultural. Our, our, our culture doesn't value this, and it didn't value it at the time Jesus was put to death. It's a means of execution. This is a trophy. I wear this around my neck. The Shepinzers wear it. Many of us have crosses around our necks. Why? Because it's our trophy that says that this is our, our means of victory. This is how Christ overcame death, and this is how we overcome our sins and death and lead to the great reward of eternal life in God's kingdom. That's God's victory. All right, let's move on to uh, try to speed this up a little bit here. Uh, some of these responses. Uh, fortitude. There's the uh, there's a line from the Wizard of Oz, by the way. I put this picture on here because I remember the Wizard of Oz. He wanted courage, and he asked the wizard for courage, and the, and the wizard basically told him, "Well, I don't have courage to give you. It's there. Uh, it's in your heart." And that's really where we look to for courage or fortitude. It's it's something that God has written on our own hearts. The name Adam Buckley has just uh, it's the name of a, a runner. Uh, I took a story from the uh, Runner's Pro magazine. Uh, by Adam Buckley, not a real well-known runner, but a pretty good runner. And what the story was about, uh, some of the challenges that he faces as a runner, those of you who are runners, you might uh, be able to relate to this experience. Sometimes I do a speed workout at the track. When I go to the track and you see some of these sleek runners that just seem to be gliding effortlessly around the track, it's like, how do they do that? You know, when I'm there, I'm like puffing and puffing and you know, just trying to go as fast as I can, but it's, it's a, every step is a struggle sometimes. When you read his story, he's a very fast runner, but he describes how difficult it was for him running a marathon and, and the, the walls that he had to overcome in order to finish. And so my point there is that it always looks easy for other people, you know, and so we just have to remind ourselves sometimes that our own challenges uh, come from within and that our own response to that, our courage, our fortitude comes from within. Mary Elizabeth Lang is a Catholic hero. She was a nun, founded a, a community in Haiti, and then uh, brought it here to the United States. Fortitude comes from God, and it comes in all uh, shapes and sizes. Faith. Uh, my name, my first name is Thomas, so I can kind of relate to the doubting Thomas, and uh, and, and the doubts that he had to overcome. You know, he's not the only one that had to deal with, with doubts. And, uh, you know, in some, in some ways, maybe St. Thomas was looked down on because he was a doubter, but actually I think he gave us a very great gift because he showed all of us that it's natural to have doubts. And it being a person of faith is a matter of overcoming our doubts. So if, if, you, have, if you don't have any doubts, then you have certitude, then you have knowledge, and you have knowledge, then you, that's not faith. Faith is believing in things over which we have some doubt about that. So that's why St. Thomas is a great um, apostle, a great model for us. Confidence and faith go hand in hand. Again, as a coach, I, I often talk to uh, players, especially my goalies, about the importance of confidence. To be a good goalie, you have to, to tell yourself, I can stop the shot, I can stop everything. And you have to be able to, to, to have that kind of confidence. What does the word confidence mean? It comes from from two Latin words, con, which comes from the preposition con, which means with, and fide, which means faith. Confidence means to act with faith. And so to have faith about something means that in the world of sports, or actually in anything that we do in life, God has given us certain gifts and talents and abilities. And to be confident means that we know that we are going to use our gifts and our talents and our abilities uh, the best that we can. People ask me sometimes about prayer and sports. I've got a great uh, autographed picture from Tim Thomas, who uh, won the Stanley Cup as a goalie with the Boston Bruins in 2011. 
And he sent me this picture, and he wrote down there to Bishop Tom, do you pray before games like I do? So I wrote back to him, and I thanked him for the autographed picture, and I said, dear Tim, uh, thanks, yes, I do. I pray before games, during games, after games, almost every shot is coming at, at me. You know, it's a breakaway, it's like, help the Lord. And if I may say, thank you, Jesus. You know, so prayer is a very important part of uh, my sports experiences, as just, I think it should be for everyone, and that what you do in everyday life, whatever challenges we're facing, we say, our, we say a prayer. It could be a quick prayer, help me Lord, that's a prayer. It doesn't have to be some long, elaborate kind of prayer, or when something goes right, thank you Lord, that's a prayer of gratitude. And they're very important for us to have those kinds of prayers. When people ask me, sometimes you pray to win, and I, I don't. I, I, I don't pray to win. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think my teammates and people that I play with will tell you I'm very competitive. I love to, to win and I hate to lose. But I also believe, as a Catholic and as a bishop, that on the day of, of judgment, when we are asked to give an account of our lives to the Lord, I really don't think God is going to ask, What was your one and lost record? I don't think he cares if you, if you lost every game uh, that you ever played. I think the Lord does care about this. He'll say, I gave you certain gifts and, and talents and abilities. How did you use them? Did you use those gifts and talents to the best of your ability? And hopefully the answer there is, is yes. I'll tell you, nothing upsets me more, uh, frustrates me more than underachievers. Because I don't consider myself to be the world's best athlete or the world's smartest person. So I always kind of, uh, you know, really get upset when I see somebody that has a lot of talent and ability and is not using it. I think you're wasting the gifts that God gave you. Uh, and so, so it's very important that, that we use those gifts because I think, as I said, that's, that's what our Lord is going to ask us about. And in terms of, of sports, I tell players this. I said, well, if you play, if you pray to play to the best of your ability, and you do play to the best of your ability, and if your abilities are better than the other teams, you'll win. Now, if the other team is also playing to the best of their ability, and they're better than you are, then you probably will lose. And that's not a bad thing. As I said, it's not bad if you lose, uh, but if you're playing to the best of your ability. And so uh, I think that's uh, something very important for us to, to win, to remember in life about our perspective on that. Uh, it was St. Augustine who said that we should uh, pray as if everything depends on, on God, but act as if everything depends on you. I paraphrase that a little bit for sports to say pray as if everything depends on God, play as if everything depends on you. And I think that's a good lesson to remember. God is faithful, and in the end, he will, it is our faith that uh, leads us to God and uh, to our eternal reward. Family. I mentioned how growing up, I played hockey with my brothers in the basement of our pharmacy, and uh, called that uh, the Sermon Coliseum. It was on Sermon Road in Chicago. We was our, our Coliseum. The Paprocki name. I come from a family that you know, I have great uh, esteem for my father and his grand my, and my grandfather who was a pharmacist and. And we were, when we were growing up, it was because we had a business in the neighborhood, we were impressed from a very young age. You know, we've got a reputation to uphold here. Because if our family has a bad reputation, they're not going to come to our pharmacy. So we always had that sense that you have a reputation to uphold. And that's the same as true if you play with a team, you represent a team, not just your individual. And Ultimately, we are part of a team that we call the church. And so when we do something that reflects badly, it re does not reflect badly only on us, it reflects badly on the church, on the team. And we see that in a very unfortunate way in many of the scandals that we've had in the church that don't reflect only poorly on those who are the perpetrators, but also on the whole team. And so that's why we have to, to work very hard to deal with those. Um, Family, for me, as I said, being from a big family, uh, family was an important part of my world of sports, and it's a very important part of our, our faith life. That, you know, Jesus 
did not come to just give us an individual philosophy. He founded a church. He said to Peter and the apostles, you are the rock on which I will build my church. The church is a community, and in that sense it's a team. Why? Because the team is where we get our support. The church is where we get our support. On our path to God, it's very difficult to do that individually, but with the team's help, we can do that. And of course, the model family is the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Friendship, just a few brief words about friendship here. I mentioned Mike Sweeney. Uh, Mike Sweeney is retired from baseball now. He used to be uh, first baseman for the Kansas City Royals. He's involved in a group called the Catholic Athletes for Christ, uh, which I'm the uh, bishop's uh, moderator. And uh, he um, he wrote, he had, gave a talk in which he, he talked about Billy the Kid, who was a, a very famous gangster in the Wild West. And Billy the Kid's tombstone, where he's buried with his pals, has no names on it. It just has this, these four letters, pals. Billy the Kid buried with his pals. These are pals that were buried together. Well, Mike Sweeney uses this acronym to talk about friendship. P stands for partnership. Your, your pals are your partners, your teammates, the people that you, you work with. A stands for accountability. That teammates have to be accountable to each other and hold each other accountable. L stands for love, so that teammates have a, a, a friendship, a love for each other. God is the love. God, your whole heart, mind, and soul, love your neighbor and yourself. And S stands for security. There's a certain security that you have with your friendships. Um, true friendships inspire us. They're face to face, and, and love uh, deepens our friendship. Ultimately. Uh, the, the greatest friendship that we can have is with Jesus. And that's what our, our faith is all about. It's our human friendships that help us to appreciate more uh, the friendship uh, that we have uh, with our Lord. And finally, fun. You know, when you, we, when we talk about uh, religion, sometimes uh, we tend to think, well, matters of religion and church and faith is all very serious. And there is a, certainly a serious side to it, but there's got to be a side to it that uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of joy. Because that ultimately, we talk about the joy of our faith, uh, the attitude to Sermon on the Mount. Each one starts out. Jesus said, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." Uh, blessed, the word "blessed" in Latin "beatus" means it could be translated in a number of ways: blessed, happy, lucky. So there's a sense of, of something very good about being uh, a Christian. And we can learn something about that from the world of sports. I was, uh, at the beginning of this hockey season, I mentioned our, our goalie this year is a freshman. And so he's, he's kind of small, and so he came in, and I think he was very intimidated. Um, he won, we won our first game, 10 to six, so we won the game, but we gave up six goals. He was a little shaky. Uh, won the next game, so he got a little better, but then he, he lost, and he was really, down after that game, and I could see it. And so we had a, our next game was against uh, a very good team, uh, Champaign, Illinois, at their arena. Uh, very intimidating. So after the warm ups, they skates over the bench, and I usually have a few words with the goalie before we before he starts the game. So he comes over for like, like some last minute advice. I asked him, I said, his name is Keith, I said, Keith, why do you play this game? Or I said, what's the objective of this game? I said, not just tonight. But hockey in general, why do you play hockey? He paused for a minute and he said, to win. I said, no. No, that's not the main objective. The main objective is to have fun. That's why you play this game. And as a coach, that's what I try to instill in players. I think that's the most important lesson we can give a player, is to have fun. I said to them, I want you to enjoy this game so much that you want to keep playing it as long as I am. That's why I keep playing it, because it's fun. And I don't want you to get so down or so dejected after, after a loss that you say, I hate this game, I don't want to ever play it again. And if that happens, then, then I fail as a coach and you fail as an athlete if you hate your, your sport. My objective is to have fun. Yeah, losing is tough, but you have to remember in the end, it's all about fun. And the same with our faith. Our faith is something that there are challenges, there are hardships, certainly our ideals are not always easy to live up to. But in the end, 
being a Christian and following Jesus should be something that fills our heart with joy and makes us very happy uh, in order to follow our Lord. And the ultimate joy that we have is going to be to share with God forever in his kingdom, to see the Lord face to face, and to share his love for all eternity. And that is a very happy and a very joyful thing. I'd like to, uh, speaking of fun, I guess it would be appropriate for me to end here with a joke. So I've got a little joke here. Uh, it involves nuns and hockey. So these nuns went to a hockey game. And uh, they were a traditional community that wore a traditional habit with a very large uh, kind of uh, veil and, and a head ornament. That uh, so at the ring, the men sitting behind them were having a hard time kind of seeing around the sisters because of their headgear. So they started making snide remarks. And one of them says, Oh, why don't we go to Montana? I hear there's only 50 nuns in Montana. And another one says, Well, maybe we should go to Utah. There's only 20 nuns in Utah. And then another third guy says, No, we should go to Wyoming. There's only 10 nuns in Wyoming. At that, sister turns around, looks at these guys, and says, Why don't you go to hell? There aren't any nuns in hell. <laughs> well, I, uh, I hope that these uh, eight steps, uh, these eight pointers in life, will be uh, helpful for you. And I hope that you learned something here tonight. If you have not read the book yet, I hope this whet your appetite to, to read it. And uh, I'll go into more details in the book that uh, hopefully will be helpful to you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I guess we have an opportunity for, for questions for a few minutes. We have a microphone here if anybody has a question. This young man right in front of here has a question. Here, wait, let's wait, wait for the microphone so we can hear you. Thanks, Sean. Did you ever try out for the Blackhawks? <laughs> Did I what? Ever try out. Did try out? Try Did out? I try out with the Blackhawks? No. No, because as I said, I, I didn't learn how to skate until I was a little bit older, so by the time I learned how to ice skate, I think it was a little bit too late uh, for me to get there, but uh, uh, you play hockey? No? Are you a fan? Not really. <laughs> he, he, plays, like he, he plays baseball. Though. Baseball? He's a oh, catcher, okay. so that's kind of like being hockey. There you go. Hockey, right? Very good. Any other questions? Another question somewhere? Okay, well, if, uh, as I said, if there's more you want to know, it's in the book, and as I said, it will be uh, available in the lobby if anybody would like me to autograph my book uh, for them. Thank you. You've been very attentive.